I would like to welcome Dr. Madison Burrell, who is a board certified pediatric neuropsychologist at Children's National Health System and the director of research for the Division of Pediatric Neuropsychology. She is a tremendous asset. We are delighted to have her here to um, help us better understand cognition and memory and listen and be a partnership in our questions and our journey. Thank you. Thank you. So just a couple of things. One, I, I saw some of you guys taking pictures. I did tell Eileen, like, these slides are, you guys can have them. I think they already have this presentation. So um, she can send it out, or I, I don't know how you're going to distribute that, but those, just so you know, um, they're all yours. Um, and um, the other part is this is really your day. So I'll ask at little different points if you have questions, but please, it does not bother me if you have a question. It's a lot of information, and I know I can't keep it all in my head sometimes, so either write it down or please interrupt and ask a question about what we're talking about there. It's, it's totally fine. Um, so uh, just an overview, I'm going to give you a little bit of a heads up of what neuropsychology is in case you haven't seen any, a neuropsychologist yet, why it's important. Um, and what we know about neuropsychological outcomes in kids with HH or adults with HH. Um, and then really, I am going to give you a lot of resources. I may not talk about every little thing, but again, with these slides, it's something that you can take home with you in terms of some recommendations and resources, whether it's books, suggestions, websites. And there is a lot of information out there in general, even if it's not with kids specifically with HH. So I'm sorry, I'm going to keep saying kids, but you know, anybody. Um, and then just the idea that we are working, um, as Dr. Kerrigan said, just to know more, which we still certainly do need to know more about. So neuropsychology is really a study of learning and behavior in relationship to the brain. It's a framework that draws from the cognitive sciences, neuroanatomy, neurology, um, and then good old psychology. So clinical, I am trained as a clinical psychologist. I did my dissertation in marital therapy, which comes in handy working with families. Um, and, but also then um, we, we do some extra training as a neuropsychologist to um, really understand the brain and behavior together. Um, so with children, for sure, now we're trying to understand all of that in the context of a moving target over development, OK? Um, what I do, um, usually it's over the course of a day, but some practitioners work over a couple days. Also, some kids require more days. They just can't sustain the full day of testing. Um, so I take a history and I talk to you for a while to get all the background information. I, we do do a lot of tests, again, depending on the child and what they can do. Um, that can take many, many hours sometimes. Sometimes it's not as long. Um, and we cover a lot of d domains, which I'll go over. And then the really important thing and what you guys do most often and really need to come convey to us is the observation. So our tests are imperfect. I actually don't have a test of rage attacks. So I need you to tell me what's that like and where that comes from. So I don't, I, I haven't characterized that in a measure yet. So um, we need to use all that information to really come to an integrative summary of what your child is doing in the context of their medical disorder, their development, your family history, all of that stuff. So together we get an understanding. We do do diagnoses that help us get services, school placement, those kinds of things. Those can be important. And then the most important part are recommendations for intervention, remediation, whatever it happening. And then the, with things like surgery and over time with a child, we're doing constant follow-up to see how those things change, comparing it to what was happening before. Um, and then the case management is helping you get hooked up with services and things like that. So that's what I do clinically. Um, the domains that I'm covering are um, varied, and this is what's different from some of the other practitioners that you, you'll see. You may see a speech language pathologist, which is focusing on language. So I do a little bit of language, but I also talk about um, measure and talk about attention, IQ, visual processing, memory and learning, motor, academics, and social emotional functioning. So that's a lot to cover, and we try to put those together and get a 
profile of strengths and weaknesses across these skills. So it's huge to talk about recommendations of things that are not going so great for your kids. But what's even better and more powerful is I need to know what those strengths are because that's probably where they're going to move on. And that's what they need to bring in order to shore up their weaknesses. So it's important to get the highs and the lows and to understand those. So again, how is seeing someone like me different from other providers? And again, other providers are awesome, and it doesn't matter what they are. If they're good, you go with them. But just to give you a sort of some basics, I, a neuropsychologist do do an extra two years of postdoctoral training, which um, comes in with that brain and behavior understanding. We're often embedded more with the medical team, so I every week go to my surgery meeting, so I know exactly what's going on um, with the kids that are coming through and can give feedback right away. Um, the tools and measures may be different, but they may be the, sp the same, but um, especially as kids get older or higher functioning kids where we're really getting into memory and attention and executive functioning, the school psychologist doesn't do that as much typically or doesn't do it as deeply or in different ways that we might do. So again, it's maybe a deeper, broader than what some of what you're going to get at the school. Um, Schools do IQ and academics wonderfully, so that is great. It's kind of the other domains that they may not have as many resources. Um, again, the feedback and the interpretation of the data is going to be different based on what I know and what, who I'm working with um, and, under, and understanding seizures in general. A lot of practitioners may not even work with kids with seizures as, as often, so um, that can be helpful in understanding the context of what's going on. And again, we're very complementary to what other providers are doing. I think other providers um, have very specific recommendations as far as like if you need an augmentative communicative device, I don't work with that as often, and you need someone that knows the difference between all of those. So that's great. You should talk to your speech language therapist about that. Um, and then the treatment and therapy part, I typically don't do therapy. Um, so it's really important that the, the person who's going to be seeing your child all along is giving information, and they can have a totally different view than what I'm saying. So again, we should work together. Okay, um, so the truth is, I just wanted to, you know, but full disclosure, I saw one child prior to Dr. Olubu coming, this is our neurosurgeon, um, one child with HH, um, because that was Dr. Bruce, who is a surgeon that was visiting with us um, and uh, did a resection in 2004. Since Dr. Olubu has come, and he is a functional neurosurgeon that uses visual aids, now I've seen six since 2014. So just understanding that. But I've seen a lot of kids with epilepsy. So the idea that it's the gelastic seizures, but then so many of your kids have other types of seizures, that's where the understanding will also come in um, and into play. Um, why is that? Because there's not a lot of you guys. Um, and again, the course before these surgical advances were really more bleak. And so, I'm ho and so I, it, they were well served by people in the school because they could um, do the evaluation. But as kids are more functional and having better outcomes now and doing surgery, they're coming to us, which is great. Um, Again, the importance of neuropsych outcomes, I think you guys know that. As parents, we know that. But it's nice that some of these formal um, institutions, like the National Institute of Neurological Disorders up at NIH, um, have, has made the idea of not just the seizures, but everything beyond the seizures an important thing to look at and study. And that really that is um, sometimes the hardest thing to deal with other than the seizures um, on a day-to-day -day with families. Um, there was the landmark Institute of Medicine report that pretty much said that the burden of epilepsy is more than just the seizures and, com and comorbidities can be more impairing than the seizures themselves. I think that's a little bit of a no-duh from your guys' perspective, but just want to put it out there that uh, that is there. So what do we know about HH neuropsych functioning? Um, as Dr. Kerrigan already pointed out, 
there are risk factors that we know for poor cognitive outcome, and it's not different from epilepsy in general. The earlier age of seizure onset, aka there's more seizures, um, impairs your functioning. A larger lesion size in general and can, uh, is, can be more impairing. Um, if you have comorbid behavioral problems or the rage attacks, um, if you're having to take more drugs, um, and those all point to a, a more severe disease and, and more burden. So though, that's why that is associated. It makes sense that it's associated with poor outcomes. Um, again, now that we have surgical approaches and different ones and more of them, um, I am going to point out that different surgical approaches seem to have different outcomes, um, and that is changing very rapidly in your kids. Um, the other thing that we see is that kids that are higher functioning pre-surgically, it sort of is counterintuitive that they have worse surgical outcomes, but in some ways it, they have more to lose, right? So if you're taking something from their brain, they potentially have more to lose. That's not always the case, but that's it's just just keep in mind that that drop may, and it may be temporary, it also means they may have more to gain later in rehab, so be careful on that one. Um, so that's not new news, you heard that already. But, <laughs> lasers. Um, so it's a game changer. I really think it is. Um, and again, some of these outcome studies, you have to be careful because th those were kids that had different older techniques. And I think you have to be aware of that when you're reading those articles. Again, I'll try to point that out. And I would love to hear Dr. Kerrigan's input from this. The first report of an MRI-guided thermal ablation in children was so recent. That was like five years ago in a kid. So I know there's some other ones. But um, so this is new news. Um, and so this follow-up, we just don't know yet. Also, again, I this is a newer literature to me, so me just going through, through it, all the different names for all the different kinds of surgeries, I just be aware of what they are because there are differences, and Dr. Karen did, Kerrigan did a lovely job um, pointing them out, but I think you have to be aware of that when you're looking at these studies of what did they do and when. So this may not be exhaustive, but again, I would like you to, um, is this a laser beam here? Oh. Is it? Oh, good. Okay. Um, to be aware, I, this may be helpful for you. And I kind of started up at the top with these two. And these are more resective surgeries. So the one, the open surgeries where the no lasers going on. And again, the same data of seizure freedom. And I also use the same um, thing of no, absolutely no seizures. Um, and what I want you to look at is the age range here. Um, also, the fact that if you had gelastic only seizures, so the fact that most of this, this wasn't reported in the first two, but most of these studies, it's not just the gelastic seizures, they have other seizure types. And other seizure types, if you take Dr. Kerrigan's model of you have a normal brain, then gelastic seizures, and then the other ones develop perhaps as a downward stream of that, the fact is that you may be getting further down the progress, and so is it not important, if you had surgery at two, and you're maybe just a gelastic only, you may have a better outcome because you haven't had that downward stream of, of other seizures coming into play, and maybe those seizures do, those in, in seizure surgery in general, if you have a lesion that is tight and you know what you're going after and there's nothing else going on in the brain, you have a better outcome perhaps. And so these are things to all think about. I didn't see in any of these studies, maybe in others, where are the outcomes different by age if you had surgery done at two, three, four years old versus anybody later? And I think that would be super interesting to know about. Um, and same with the outcomes for, for memory. So what I'm talking about here is these studies um, report just this transient short-term memory loss and, and how often that happened. And then this study is a recent study um, 
of surgery, mixed surgery types, the I-beam guys in Freiburg and then um, Dr. Kerr Kerrigan's cohort, only the resection um, folks um, in, at the Barrow. And um, not only did they do short-term memory, but they looked at long-term memory. And so I'll talk, I'm gonna go into depth into both of these two studies. But this Sonata study, just I think it's pretty hot off the press. Um, I think this is the only series that's um, ablation only. Um, and they have really great seizure freedom outcomes. And they don't have, they haven't reported on this, but they've actually improved IQ. And I'm going to go into that. I really think this study, if your children, and I don't know the layout here, if your how many kids have already gone to surgery here? And how, keep your hands up if it was ablation of some sort. So I think this is your kids here. I'm hoping this is your kids. And I'm interested to hear back from you guys if you think your outcomes are like this. And I'm hopeful that hopefully going forward these um, surgical techniques are really going to be helpful for the outcomes because um, they look way better than these older studies. Okay. Um, also, just keep in mind things like some of these studies have children that couldn't even be tested preoperatively because of either behavior or just low functioning, those kinds of things. So sometimes you're, what the score is reported is also missing a good chunk of kids that were basically a zero on some of these scores. I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, and again, we talked about seizure freedom. Some of these rates are much higher if you count pretty rare, rare seizures, which is a huge improvement. Um, okay, so I'm gonna focus on this recent one, and I, I really just wanna highlight, it, it is really the most recent and largest study solely with patients who have ha undergone a laser technique. The surgeries occurred between October 1997 and December 2014, and they achieved 85% seizure freedom. What this slide shows you is that across their patients, their, their IQ, their um, intellectual quotient, they're doing things like vocabulary, nonverbal, putting blocks together, figuring out um, puzzles. Um, this is what their performance is prior to surgery. I put, this is a little low actually, that should be up here, but this line here, if it, at 70, is, um, what we would consider for intellectual disability, okay? So you, what I want you to notice here, there's a huge range, which is lovely, and that they're um, pre-surgically, um, you're, you're seeing kids that, um, you know, are doing poorly, but you also see a lot of kids doing well. And this is adults too, I believe. Um, the other thing here is now we're looking at post-operative change of verbal IQ compared to their preoperative. So what's nice about this, and I'll, I'll go into more, no matter where you are preoperatively, sometimes you have change and sometimes you don't. But again, I don't know why these moved. Uh, I would say the majority of this group had some degree of change. Now, whether you think going from zero to one point in IQ is an important change or not is, is the trick. But I would say once you're starting to get into, you know, eight, nine points, that's half a standard deviation, I'll take it. I would take a couple more points for that. So you have a lot of kids really showing improvement over time. Um, the important thing we talked about is when, when was this change, and it really did vary, but it's on average about three years after surgery. Okay. Um, they also did a nice thing of they, they talked about sort of the kids that are below 70 and the kids that are above 70 and what their average IQ change. So again, on average, the higher IQ kids, which again may have more to gain as well as more to lose, they changed about seven points on average compared to the lower functioning kids, but they also changed, okay, six points there. So I, I think it's, that's hopeful. Um, oops, going wrong way. Um, so who improves? So significant I, in this study, significant IQ improvement if you had no if you um, you had no gelastic seizures postoperatively, you had a bigger uh, bump of nine IQ points on average. If you continue to have gelastic seizures, then you uh, only improved about three IQ points. Um, and what you can see here is again the change 
dependent on the range of your IQ. So some of these very, very low-functioning kids, this is their preoperative, um, one, oh, sorry, this is giving you post-operative data one year later is in the gray bars, and the black bars is whether they maintain that, and that was at their last visit, whenever that was. Sometimes it was many years later, but it was at least beyond a year later. So what's nice about this is that you have changes across all of them, but the bigger changes are happening sort of in this mid-IQ range preoperatively. Um, and then the everybody, other than this lower functioning group, pretty much maintain those IQ gains over time, which is, again, really nice to see. Um, and you keep improving past a year. So the summary of sort of this study is seizure freedom seems to stop that progressive IQ loss that we saw from past studies. And again, there's hope that it's not only stopping, but allowing for improvements to be seen beyond that first year. The very low IQ kids preoperatively may not see these benefits in IQ improvement as much. Um, there's certainly limitations to every study. One thing that I'll talk about a lot is IQ is only one thing in one domain. You can have really smart people and they can't even get themselves dressed in the morning. I live with one. No, just kidding. <laughs> um, um, other domains, um, especially memory, which I'll talk about a lot later, and then there's behavior, um, and then other things like caregiver stress for you know things that you guys are dealing with um, induced by sort of managing the seizures. They don't. The, none of these things are kind of addressed in this in this particular study. Um, the other study I want to talk about, and again, Dr. Kerrigan is here, so maybe he can tell us more about it, but it's just, it's just an example of reading the fine print because it's a recent study that just came out, um, and it's a large sample size of 80 kids, which is huge, um, but you have to be aware there's a difference in the surgical approach that was rep reported. Again, those I-beam um, or I-C um, implants from the Germany cohort and then from the Barrow group only a resection or disconnection cohort was included. And those surgeries occurred between 1999 and 2012. Um, and again, their seizure freedom rate, maybe this doesn't seem so high, but again, another 22. So they're around that 50% of people got really nice seizure control for the most part. And this is what they see preoperatively. Again, being mindful, what this um, author decided to look at um, and, and was not only IQ, but all these other domains, which is really helpful. And just preoperatively, this is what the sample looked like. About um, half of them had a standard deviation or two, um, which just to remind you, that's an IQ of 85 or lower is a standard deviation. So 85 or lower are these orange and red bars. And then, but about half the group is also pretty high functioning at normal or above, okay? And this is what they look like preoperatively um, and pretty similar across domains. Then what you're looking for is the change after surgery. And again, I want you to be mindful. This person, um, Dr. Wagner, used a whole standard deviation change as her criteria, which is 15 points. And that's really very rigorous, and it's a standard in terms, nobody's gonna argue that if you change 15 points, that's significant and meaningful. So that's why she used it. But remember, the study before, on average, if there's an improvement, they were looking at nine points or seven points. So is nine points more or less important than the 15 points? So again, I think this is being very rigorous, but just keep in mind why her, her numbers may not look as good because she's using a more rigorous cutoff, okay? So um, is IQ really much different than the Sonata study? And I think despite a surgical, different surgical approach and seizure outcomes, because of this cutoff, I think they're looking pretty similar on IQ. She's actually finding a lot of people, no people that really decreased. Most of them in her book are staying the same, but I actually, if you used a lower cutoff, I think she's having a lot of people that actually improved. Um, so um, there's no, the good news is nobody's declining on IQ after they've had surgery, which is good. 
But then what you see here and what the Sonata study is missing is that unfortunately you do have some serious declines across other areas. So the verbal learning, um, which is just your initial learning, then your re re delayed recall means now I'm gonna ask you 20 minutes later. So not only do you have trouble just encoding, but now retrieving that information later. Um, processing speed as well as this cognitive flexibility, which is being able to switch between sets and keep that information in mind while you're problem solving. It's a little bit more complicated executive control. And so this to me is that because the other study really hasn't looked at these other skill sets, we're, you have to be cautious and keep track of those. Um, and we may see these memory declines even if your IQ is pretty much staying the same. Okay, so um, this is the picture that came up with optimism, and I just liked it, so <laughs> that's why that's there. Um, I think with these new ablation techniques really, because of their, stop, their ability to stop seizure in the majority of ki kids is really optimistic. It's even higher in kids if you look across studies. Um, I don't know if Dr. Kerrigan would agree with that, but um, I think what's interesting is because Dr. Kerrigan is the guy, you, he probably gets more of the complicated cases. And so if he's reporting, everybody else gets the easy ones, right? <laughs> so they get higher surgical outcomes because it's the non-complicated ones. And so I, just, that's just my editorial on that. But some other places are reporting very high outcomes, which is great, but they may not be like the real deal, the whole spectrum. Um, so given the IQ gains in that big study, perhaps memory um, is not specifically affected if you think IQ is a reflection of gained knowledge over time. So it may, may if, it, if that's a proxy for memory, you're, you're getting some learning and knowledge if those IQ scores keep going up, okay? On the other hand, if you wanna be the glass half empty, if IQ gains, um, means just being available and attentive and during that testing now they did things that you know they didn't do the first time I saw them maybe you get a bump in that but IQ is cumulative and so over time if they're not learning then that IQ will eventually go back down because they aren't keeping gains so again we don't have enough information in the long term across different domains to know but you could be positive and believe all those IQ game gains or be wary and say you know what later on as they grow with higher expectations and having to learn more, those problems may emerge again. Okay, so why do, any questions just about those studies or anything right now or those outcomes? Okay, yeah. Oh, sorry, there, there. let's go back. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so big, yeah, so the question is how do you, and I'm paraphrasing, because <laughs> that's what you do in DC. Um, so you just, <laughs> um, you, uh, how do you know if you're seeing a problem if it's really related to the HH versus just a kid and normal variation and every, there's a lot of kids that have issues all the time, right? And you're now hypervigilant because your child has a rare disorder and you're watching everything they do. Um, so the answer to that is I think you use data 
Um, so whether it's a neuropsychologist, which everything we do is compared to normal four-year-olds, right? Use your teachers to say, like, is this worrying you? Because teachers see a lot of kids and know a lot of normal, and they know abnormal. And that's why we use teacher reports, too. So, But you will make yourself crazy, and you'll make your kid crazy, as well as everybody and the family member, if everything is attributed to HH. So it's not, you know. Whether a specific behavior is or isn't, that's harder. But I think if it happens a lot over time and it keeps coming up, but yeah, you got to give them a break that not everything is HH, you know, and four year olds are just kind of crazy. So, yeah. So, yes. Yeah, good question. So, um, so there's fewer neuropsychologists in the zero to three range, I would say, but that doesn't mean that they don't, there's a lot of developmental psychologists in hospital settings because there's sick babies, you know, that come through. And so for our team, I work with our child development folks that really see the zero to three kids. Um, and then we do a handoff as they go from four and above in terms of understanding what their scores were before and trying to translate those as they go up. Um, but I would see someone evaluating their cognition from zero, you know, as early as you see, you know, there's a problem. So, um, and, and that is a psychologist of some sort. So, but m then there's most neuropsychologists are, see are seeing kids from as early as age three and above. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say. When do you see a nurse psychologist was that question. Yeah. Yeah, so that's a good question. So, um, so the question is, where do you do the evaluation? Do you do it in the home or the clinic setting? So, yeah, traditionally we're set up to have you see us. Like, insurance doesn't pay me to come out to you, sorry. And I don't have telemedicine to do testing, which is what we've talked about a lot. Um, so I'm going to miss it. And that's the downside of a neuropsychological evaluation. It's a new setting. It's with a stranger. It's in a quiet room and some kids actually do better because I'm giving them all sorts of positives and stickers and you're so great and this is fun and they get one-on-one -on -one attention like all day long. So it can go both ways. So how we combat that is getting reports from you with that history as well as formal measures to say, but how is this in the day-to-day? -day? And I've had it go both ways. I've had kids look awesome with me, but it they're a mess at school at home and then there's other kids that come in and they didn't sleep well and they it's like a bad day for them and so they look terrible with me but really they're actually doing much better when you know they're less anxious or they slept better or those kinds of things on a better day so we definitely take that into account but capturing that and you know the drawback of neuropsychological evaluations is we say oh come see us in two years you know that kind of thing and really better data we would know would be like more consistent over time and I do think your therapists do a better job of collecting that kind of change on a smaller time scale and seeing whether things are really growing or not so but it's a it's a limitation yes Oh, nice. Yes. And the other point I wanted to make was she had damage to her mammillary body in one of her procedures. So her short term memory was due to, I guess, the death of the mammillary body, as I understand it. And how does that, that, that manifest itself in one, but the short term memory issue, where does it come from now? Were they always there, or is it still there? 
Yeah, so I'm not sure how you would test short-term memory at one, right? You know, other than I. Yeah, you know, right. So I w I just had that passy, and now where did it go? You know, those kinds of things. So so I think it's an excellent point, which I'll repeat for the recording, is that. When we test things, sometimes things look okay. It's same with attention. So the variability of normal attention at one years old is crazy because kids don't attend at one years old beyond a couple of seconds sometimes. That would be normal. They would get distracted to something else. So our ability to capture a real deficit is harder. That signal is so much smaller, right? So exactly what you're saying is that I, it may not be until they're six, seven years old that you don't expect them to do planning and organization at five and six years old. They're actually, they might have a different disorder if they are, <laughs> you know? So these things do emerge over time, which is the benefit of being monitored is that sometimes as the demands change on them and what you would expect to come on board in terms of development, that's where the gap occurs. So that is there. Um, now I don't think I'm answering your question. Oh, Natalie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So structurally, I don't know. It, would that have occurred right then? Yeah, so, so most likely the injury occurred at the time of surgery. There isn't any kind of a process later where cells will then begin. No, they think it was during the end of the but they never noticed it until many years later because then they started to see something called hormone issues because the young brain rewires itself. But then you notice it in an MRI. Later. Yeah, well, and that can be changes in MRI. So we've gotten stronger and more powerful cameras too. So maybe that's why they didn't notice it then or when they took the picture, if she was still swelling or those kinds of things. But again, the neuropsych signaling, hey, she's having this issue and they relook and see this is the reason why is helpful. So yeah. yeah. Okay, so it can, the, the structural damage. Okay, great, thank you. So this, this slide is really just to tell you, so why, when you have, in some cases, kind of a small little spot in the brain, why can the problems be so far-reaching and so devastating? And I think, you know, this may be a theme that comes up later, and particularly with the imaging talk later. And what we're interested in as well is that you know, where the hypothalamus sits, um, it's not so much that, but what it's connected to. And it, it is really c connected to a lot of different things that are very important for a lot of different functions. And so um, this paper actually makes the case of why this network model of, he's talking about emotion in particular, but you guys obviously know a lot that emotion is involved, um, of, of why such a, um, circumscribed area can have such wide-ranging effects. And so that's just what this illustrates for you. Um, and again, what we're talking about, whether um, it's the actual where the lesion is or it's very close to other things that do very important things uh, functionally in terms of memory and the mammillary bodies are connected to the hippocampus, which is super important for memory. Um, and again, the other point which I've already mentioned is that it's not just the gelastic seizures, but if this idea that other seizure types um, arise um, and the majority of the kiddos have those other t seizure types depending on where those are disrupting and what functions those places are involved in, you now have 
a temporal lobe epilepsy problem, and that also then has connections to several other areas in the brain. So it's definitely a network model is what we need to be looking at when we're thinking and trying to fix these issues. Um, and this, that second focus, from what I understand medically, may or may not be independent of uh, the hypothalamic focus. So then um, that's just a second problem. Um, again, the idea that I want to take from that paper is that this model clarifies why the impact of emotion is wide-ranging. It's interlocked with perception, connection, cognition, motivation, and action. So again, these are all very connected. In addition, again, what happens when there's an insult in these areas as the brain is developing and you've altered now your question and point of, how these things normally would have connected to, to together at an early age. So I do a little bit of imaging, and I just like this picture of a dog and an MRI because it's cute. Um, but um, we do have a little bit of evidence to s start to know what is happening post-surgically over time and that we do see changes um, in the networks. And I'm just going to present one study. This actually isn't my study, but I think it's really nice. Um, work that um, should be continued. So DTI is diffusion tensor imaging, and this really looks at the white matter tracks, so those connections, the highways between areas, which is how information gets passed is super important in order for these areas to talk. And so just structurally what's happening with those tracks. And what you can see is that the in this case where you have a focal epilepsy on one side of the hemisphere, they're seeing that there's evidence that the other hemisphere over time compensates and has increases in a metric of white matter um, after the surgery. And that increase in um, connectivity using diffusion um, there's more changes in the frontal section, so there's certain areas of the brain that are more plastic or more amenable to changes, and the frontal lobes are one of those. And the frontal lobes are really important for attention and executive functioning and controlling um, all the knowledge that you have, as well as controlling your behavior. So again, there's more changes in certain areas of the brain, and also that there's some people that um, ha do, even on this short, small study, those changes are associated with better functional changes, which is, again, really promising and hopeful, and um, more studies like this need to be done. Um, so I just want you to know that that is coming, and we would have understanding of, like, how could your your child that may be doing better with STM and a different child is not, what did they do differently in their brain to make a better connection that maybe is helping them? Um, again, this is the same study and just showing that these two regions in the frontal lobe are associated with outcome in terms of um, changes on scores. So um, again, I just wanted to let you know that that hasn't been done in HH kids, but that surgery certainly does change the brain, the brain, and the fact that the brain does make changes, in, and um, those may be beneficial. So that brings us to the idea of principles of developmental plasticity. Um, there's the idea that better opportunity for recovery when you have an injury or surgical intervention younger um, because you have more plasticity in the brain. This is evident from um, a lot of literature with our hemispherectomy kids where we take a whole hemisphere and we need to. And remarkably, even if we take a hemisphere before the age of five, and even if that was the hemisphere where language resides, because language is a lateralized function, it's usually on one um, hemisphere, if you take that language, they will still develop language and they'll use the other hemisphere. So it's a dramatic example of the brain can take up things that normally wouldn't have happened. On the other hand, those same kids, motor function isn't the same. They may get some motor function back in terms of being able to use an arm, a helper arm, but they'll never be able to be a neurosurgeon with that hand. <laughs> you know, So um, there's, there's varying degrees of recovery, and it depends on where in the brain, what function, those kinds of things. So it's just some examples of what might be affected and the variation in what could be recovered. 
um, again, and this idea of in areas that are still under development, the frontal lobes, the hippocampus, then those are hopefully opportunities for growth and rehabilitation. Memory span itself has a rapid increase from ages four to 12. So that's a big window for us to work on that. Um, and so, you know, how much was done you know, um, in therapies before, I think people maybe didn't have anything to recommend. One idea here is that knowing that memory is still growing, that's definitely a window that we should be hitting it hard in terms of cognitive rehab. Um, the changes in memory abilities do change um, according not so much to the span per se, but your ability to use strategies to remember, and that's the organization and executive functioning aspects of memory. Um, and so that might be more of a problem. This integration of information is a higher order task, and we don't expect kids to do that till later. Um, and again, this idea of memory problems may not emerge until age 10 or later. Was it 10? Okay, yeah. So um, we see that quite a bit. Um, and again, this is areas not well studied, but we're getting there. Um, OK, I'm going to talk about cognitive rehabilitation. There's a recent review of cognitive rehabilitation after epilepsy surgery and no pediatric studies. So that's where we're at with that. But 33 studies um, did include adults. Um, cognitive rehab strategies were varied across these, and I'll go into some of these. None of them are randomized trials, and only one study involved standardized methods. So there's a lot of work, even in the adult studies, to be done here. Um, and results were not convincing for effectiveness. So I don't think that's necessarily true that it doesn't work. I think just how it was measured, possibly, and the variability in how of trying to pick one measure across different people, sometimes you cloud the, the, the signal. Can I just ask, um, for the older teens and adults, were you looking specifically at the cognitive studies, or were you able to look at traumatic brain injuries? Right. So this was specific to epilepsy because there's a lot of literature for TBI and other populations and more. And so my recommendations really pull from the brain injury work with children. So, so exactly. So this is just a more recent review of in epilepsy surgery, what do we know and what do we, and, and I do think that the epilepsy community is a little behind the curve in terms of recommending cognitive rehab after surgery. And it should be a recommendation, and I'll tell you why. I think I have it on here. So right, so, for, so from TBI work, um, they result in the same issues of memory attention and processing speed, but programs are often started in an inpatient setting, right? And if you're walking or talking, or walking and talking, insurance isn't going to approve you to be in an inpatient program for any amount of time. That's even if you've been in a car accident with a brain injury and you don't know where what's happening at all. You don't remember anything. If you're walking but can say that, they're not going to keep you. And for the most part, the kids that are going to surgery for epilepsy are in this group. You know, they can be in and out the same day, right? <laughs> so it's like, you know, the um, at least the adults can. The kids stay a little longer now. So insurance isn't going to pay for traditional cognitive rehab, and that's where the folks are that are using all these strategies. So that's the disconnect. It's not that we don't want to recommend it. It's hard for you guys to get it. <laughs> so there are outpatient settings um, that may be helpful. My advice to you, given that, context is try to find a provider that actually has some experience in cognitive rehab because they're going to be thinking along those lines and so that and sometimes they end up in the schools but they've had some training in a cog rehab setting and so if you ask them that question hey have you ever done that or do you know anybody in the community that might be the person for you um, and a lot of different providers have cognitive rehab training so it's speech language therapists OTs PTs and then neuropsychologists as well. So um, I think that's kind of your best bet for now in terms of finding that person. Okay, so I'm going to move on to some recommendations, unless anyone has questions about that piece. Yeah. Yeah. 
they don't remember what you had told them to do, or they're not putting, uh, they don't remember, um, and, and now again, again, it depends on what age they are, um, and there's lots of other factors that can play into memory, but like, if they're not getting the routine of, um, you know, their day, is that, and again, this it, it could be executive issues as well as and attention issues as well as memory. So I'll talk about that. But they're not learning information that they've studied up on. You know, in formal school, it's a little bit easier to see because they're not getting those times tables. You know, they're not um, even though they've been drilled on it. You know, those kinds of things. Sometimes that's a specific problem, but they're definitely like they they knew the information. You had their attention. They actually repeated it back to you, and they used that information in a short time. But then a day or two later, it's like it never happened, right? So it is hard to detect sometimes, but it's still that idea of they're just not carrying information from time to time and using that in the way that they need to to function. Does that make sense? And it could be for lots of other reasons. Again, that's why it's good to see a neuropsychologist because some people do come in and they say, a lot of people say that their kids have memory problems. A lot of kids with ADHD say they have memory problems. I don't think it's a core memory problem, but you guys have a real structural cause that really can affect the memory system proper in terms of the mammillary bodies and the hippocampus. So that's why you guys are particularly at risk for memory problems. Okay, I don't know if I saw that. Uh -huh. So I just wanna give you a little bit of a quick here on the memory, <laughs> and this goes to what we're talking about actually. I forget what I have on my slides apparently. Um, so um, about the memory process. So you get information and it may be forgotten at that point. This is kind of an attention problem. You're not, you know, it's like it's happening, but you're not really, you know, there. So you forget it. Then there's working memory, which is kind of that short-term memory. A lot of people refer to as short-term memory. And so this is um, really just in your mind. It's about that five to 15 seconds after getting information. And if you don't do rehearsal, you're going to forget it. Okay. So keeping information in mind. So like you may have, see nobody remembers phone numbers anymore, but like the classic example is like, you'd have to remember a number to dial the seven numbers and you could do that, but then you don't, you do it quickly in order to dial it and you get the connection, but then you kind of forget and you don't actually really remember the information. So that's like kind of the classic working memory example. Um, and then you have your long-term storage. So this is encoding. That's another input encoding issue. Um, and the reasons why information get forgotten may be an encoding problem. It just never really gets in. And then you have the long-term storage. That's kind of your hippocampus working. Um, and it gets consolidated over time. And now you retrieve that information. So sometimes I call that like your filing cabinet, OK? So and information goes into your filing cabinet. How you put information into your filing cabinet can really be a factor. So if information is going in but it's super disorganized, you just throw all those papers in and now you have to go in and retrieve them and you have to like pick that one piece of paper but your papers are all a mess and you're going like this to try to get that one piece of information versus the person that uses organizational strategies and has like a file folder, they can go right back in and retrieve that information super easy. Easy, right so how you store the information can be the problem more than the retrieving problem does that make sense so you can have memory problems for lots of different reasons along this path so that's the trick in terms of working with a provider who does tests at diff in different ways in order to try to sort this out but even with our tests sometimes that's hard so and some kids have problems all along the way so, you know, that's the issue. So anyway, we, if we can figure out a little bit of what, where in the memories problems there, where in this process there's problems, you have different recommendations. So if it really is about that input, one of the classic things we do is just make, don't put, you're giving them too much information. Maybe their capacity is not seven to nine chunks. Maybe their capacity is more like three to five. So you can give them three phone, three numbers in the phone number, but not all seven. So you have to simplify how much information is going in. Classic 
thing I hear all the time is like I tell my kiddo to go upstairs and like get their pajamas on and brush their teeth and get a book out for ready for bedtime and they go up and they get the book out but like not the other two so they just can't handle the three steps they, they can usually get the one you know maybe the last one you said or maybe the first one you said those kinds of things so th that's some of our, our recommendations for that um, you also need to strip away irrelevant or distracting information so um, parents do this a lot where we give an instruction, but we also said a lot of other things during that time to our kid about the day or about some other commentary, and they kind of miss the instruction. So you, if you really want them to follow the instruction, don't say, hey, I want you to go upstairs and get your pajamas on and brush your teeth and get that book, and oh, I thought you did a really great job on your book report, and da-da-da-da, because like, then they're going to say, like, oh, I, I did a great job, you know, and you've just kind of distracted them from what thing you really wanted them to do, okay? Um, inadvertently. Um, again, ensuring understanding at the outset, having them repeat it back to you, you know, or giving them strategies like there's three things, you know, one, two, three, keep them on your fingers, you know, those kinds of things so that, it's, that it gets embedded and rehearsed. Um, you can enrich um, information by linking it to previously learned knowledge. Again, that helps with a better filing cabinet. So um, if you're saying like, I want you to get those, you know, capitals pajamas on, you know, because they love the capitals and they're going to pay attention to the capitals because that's what my son does. And so get your capitals pajamas on, use your Star Wars toothpaste, and then get the book out about, um, you know, the soccer legends, you know, that kind of thing. He's a sports guy. Um, so, you know, th those kinds of things, if you link it to information, then they might remember a little bit more. Um, and then there's all sorts of things like you know, mnemonics, Roy G. Biv, you know, all those kinds of things that we use. Um, and then multimodal encoding, so visual imagery or visual prompts and cues. So some families really need to not, it doesn't really help if you say it, just say, hey, go upstairs and do your bed right time, get ready for bedtime. And what they have on their mirror is a picture of a toothbrush, their pajamas, and their book. And they know those are the three things that need to be done, okay? Um, and they really need that visual prompt to keep it in mind to get going, okay? Um, other, these are all fairly standard techniques. Again, errorless learning. You want to reduce the bad association. So if you ask an open-ended question about, you know, um, who was the first um, president and they give information about Abraham Lincoln who, you know, freed the slaves. They've now associated first president with Lincoln and the slaves, and that's not, rather than you saying the first president, George Washington, did this, da, 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 and you give the information to them clean and free rather than them trying to remember their mistake. Does that make sense? So errorless learning can be really helpful for some kids, and there's some kids that are just really prone to that, like if they hear the misinformation, even if it was their own answer, they'll hold on to that, and so that's difficult. Again, rehearsal and practice, using chunking techniques, um, verbalize and visualize, I talked about that. Um, before mnemonics, um, and a really an active process. So turning flashcards into a match game can be interesting for some kids. Learning facts or um, so, um, lists in a song or a jingle um, can be helpful. Retrieval problems, cueing, that, cueing what they're supposed to remember, using external prompts, like when you're older, lists and notepads, like we all do, you know, those kinds of things. Technology is awesome nowadays. You can send Google reminders, and for my 10 and up kids, they love me when I say, well, you could get them a smartphone. <laughs> And they're like, Dr. Pearl, yes. So, because um, that will help them remember some things. So, um, technology can be really helpful with memory. Other books and website. This Project Learn um, is an awesome website. Mark Ilvesacker, who has since um, passed away, was a giant in um, traumatic brain injury rehab. And this website has actual tutorials on using lots of these um, 
methods. Um, and sorry, this was supposed to be another thing. Improve Your Memory is another book. Visual Strategies for Improving Communication. So sometimes we can't remember unless we can talk about it. So remember that improving your language and communication can be just as important for your memory. So um, I like this book quite a bit. Um, homework Without Tears. There's just a lot of books here. Um, another thing about repeating, and again with technology, um, using all these read to me features, listening to books. Um, you certainly would qualify for an organization called bookshare.org that it's just a two page application that needs to be signed by your neurologist or your neuropsychologist and it's thousands of titles, audio titles for free, including textbooks. And so just sometimes listening that second time in the car, there's a lot of commuting around here. Sometimes I have kids, you know, listening when to the text that they're going to be learning about, and that's just an extra exposure that can really help with learning. So all those are just some tips and website uh, um, things. So flexibility. So, um, you know, I haven't worked with a lot of kids with hypothalamic hematoma. But I myself have a child with Prader-Willi syndrome, and what I've heard so far is very similar in terms of that emotional reaction is so strong, and even as a trained neuropsychologist, there's nothing I can do to break that thing sometimes, and he's so enraged. I mean, it, you could call it a rage attack. And a, for him, the trigger is often food, so that's part of his disorder, but it could be for anything. There's a piece of that that I think is really about this flexibility. He cannot move off whatever that was. And it may be food for sometimes, but it, sometimes it's like he thinks something should happen a certain way, and it's dumb. It's yesterday morning it was, I want to carry this big bowl, seriously this big, up to my room of water for my dog. And we're like, no, dude, that's just not a good idea. Either you'll spill it or the dog will spill it. You know, like, just not a good idea. But he got, it was a 20-minute yell fest around that. And it's just you're at an impasse of what he wants to do versus what you want to do. And that is a flexibility issue in my book. He can't go with somebody else's information. He's not taking it in because he's so mad sometimes. Sometimes I really can't, we cannot get anywhere until he's calm again. So the, that comes also from, there's a lot of work in the autism literature. So I would look there. There's an amazing new um, website for See Amazing and All by Sesame Street because they have a new character that has autism. And there's huge resources there. There's like these, the, what I'm showing you here are these daily routine cards. So I talked about the three pictures. They have them for brushing your teeth, get you know, going out in public to a restaurant, I think, or whatever. And so you, they first they tell the story with characters, and then they, you have resources sources of these three cards that you can use and as much as you can shortchange the language because you don't want to overdo the language with them when you're in the moment and you can have a cue card or whatever the the helpful it'll be okay um, so one resource that I think it's great another one is a teach explicitly teaching flexibility. This is really for older kids, I have to say. They're trying to ramp it down for younger, but um, this is for more verbal kids, and it's called Unstuck and On Target. It's in our schools here in Fairfax for kids with autism, but my child, who's 10 and a half now, the, his um, team um, has willingly and thankfully actually taken it on for my son in his school. And so um, I'll give you some examples of what that is, of getting unstuck and on target. And it really is teaching a child some strategies prior to them being upset and being able to use these buzzwords to get them to use the strategies. And again, it takes time, it takes work, but it really is a godsend in many ways. Does someone have a question? No, okay. Um, um, anyway, some other books about that, and, and just full disclosure, these are my buds in my department that have created this, and I'm, I'm so biased about it, because I love it. So 
examples of these self-regulatory scripts. This is the unstuck and on target, plan A, plan B. So something's not going your way, plan A, you're gonna take that big bowl of water up, <laughs> okay? So that was your plan A. What's a plan B we can have? What could we do, you know? Um, what could we make as an alternative? My plan A isn't working, I need a plan B. I need a plan B so I won't get stuck, you know, those kinds of things. You practice this and over time it's very easy, like, you know, plan A doesn't work, let's do plan, e, plan B. Big deal, little deal. So again, with several children across a lot of dif disorders, it's something that is innocuous, but it becomes like World War III. So that's become a big deal. How can we make this, uh, uh, turn this big deal into a little deal? Things like that. Let's see if we can make this a little deal by, you know, waiting five minutes or th those kinds of things. Um, other ones are choice and no choice because the truth is sometimes you just don't have a choice. I really don't want that water upstairs. <laughs> no choice. <laughs> he needs, nobody eats upstairs, you know. So there's teaching him those situations beforehand and then you can label the situation. Some situations you can have plans A, B, and C. Other situations there's choice, no choice. No choice, you cannot hit your siblings. No choice, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so again, just some examples of things that you can do um, in terms of, how are we doing on time? Just, we're over, okay. So um, I'm happy to talk about some of these, but they're there, they're on the slides, um, and I think I gave you enough information that you could find them, and certainly working with a neuropsychologist or a psychologist that would be willing or already uses them are there. I think. Oh yeah, and just, just to let you know, we are working on trying to collaborate together. So some work I've been involved in is just, if you get neuropsychologists in a room, they use a lot of different measures and they can never decide. And so what I tried to do is just ask people in, on a survey and see if there were common elements that everybody's using. And um, I think people were shocked to find, and we did this internationally, this was part of some international work for surgical outcomes. We had a huge number of responses from 19, most of them were from the US, but this is 100, uh, sorry, 80 neuropsychologists, and we're able to find several measures that 80% of the time we're all using. So there's no need to quibble, and that other 20% can come on board or not. But like, you know, that's fine. And what we wanna do is once we have these set of measures that people are at least using for now, um, then we wanna combine that with our surgical friends and this is so complex, right? We need bigger data, common measures in order to really dig in and find out if we're making a difference or how we can make a difference or all the complex questions you guys are asking about. When should I go to surgery? How should I go to surgery? When are the memory problems? What age? We're never gonna know that unless we aggregate all this data. So we are working on just trying to get people together and the fact that all those people responded, I think people are willing. It's just kind of getting the infrastructure in place to do it. Sorry. Yeah, so the question is, how, do I, how are these structures related to learning, and how do I know, I think it's, that came up again, that they have a learning disability, a memory issue, and then in a three-year-old, right? So I totally agree, again, because the variability is so great, in those younger ages, it's hard to know if when, when those memory problems are emerging or those issues. Some 
indications, though, are they're not keeping up with the milestones, right? So that's where the evaluations by the developmental pediatricians, as well as your, um, you know, s service providers, your speech language folks, your motor folks, if they're, if if you have those services, they're going to be tracking those for you, and if you're then you're going to go to a psychologist, neuropsychologist, kind of preschool, school age to start to get the formal assessments, to start tracking that information in terms of are they staying in line with their kid. The other thing, because we have all those domains, I'm comparing what I would expect for a child, and if something's kind of dropping below where their other skills are at, then that's going to also be a signal to me that there's something specific going on that is a problem, um, and they're not learning. But yeah, there's a wide range of, but you really need other people to assess that in order to give you those guide markers of is this normal or not. In terms of the connections and why the mammillary bodies, it's just because it is connected to the hippocampus, which is key for memory. So those structures we know um, from some, you know, unfortunate cases where seizures were coming from directly from the hippocampus. They're very epileptogenic, and there was a famous case called HM, and they actually thought by taking both hippocampi um, they would stop the seizures, which they did. But he also was fully amnestic and did not remember anything any longer. So we know that that is key, as well as other disorders, key to memory function. So. Sorry, there's a, go, yeah, there, go ahead. You guys both at the same time. So there, yes and no, I'm going to say. So yes, a lot of areas and different areas of the brain develop at different rates and time frames, okay? So, and some of those areas, like the frontal areas, we believe have growth and change and development through even, you know, late 20s. So insurance rates change at 25 because the decision making up until 25, the frontal lobes aren't as mature. Having said that, those are tweaks and changes. If you have some of your fundamental structural basic foundation elements of the brain, the brain is the same size starting from age five. So big changes, putting a wall in, taking a wall out, if you think of a house, those aren't going to change, and there's only so much you can do. You can do painting, you can do, you know, put in some other supportive structures, but if that wall isn't there, that wall isn't there, and that's not going to change. Does that make sense? So there's, it's a little bit of both. So, yeah. Or, yeah, the outcome is not worse. It may not be a decline, but they may not get better. So a lot of those questions, I don't know you, I, it, but if she suspects something, you go back to the neurologist. With
left. Okay. They haven't captured anything on, yeah. Captured anything. So right, so. Anxiety, you know, well, it could be, or it could be something. The problem is, is like any neurosurgeon worth their salt, they're not just, they need some evidence, right? Right? I don't know. Is that what I think? I mean, so, 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 they, so they want something, and it is hard to know, but they, so there's need, they need to capture, we generally don't go to the operating room unless we, we do know that those seizures are there, if that's the purpose of the <laughs> operating room. Um, there, you can always get a second opinion if you think somebody thinks differently. I, again, Dr. Kerrigan would probably say it's one child you, that person, you'd have to look at the films to know where it is, if some other surgeon would potentially go after it or not. Yeah, I mean, that those are tough questions, but it it's possible. Yeah, in some, in some way, yeah, in some way. I feel better with that. <laughs> so.